Our first speaker is Lily, and she's going to talk about the universe as ball and springs, molecular dynamic in Python. Lily is, is halfway through her PhD in molecular dynamic at ANU, but she doesn't have a topic yet. That's fine. Let's give us a warm welcome to Lily. Thank you. Um, well, that's pretty much all you need to know about me, so I'll get right into it. Um, in our bodies, we all have mechanisms that protect us from foreign substances messing with us. And one of um, the really important ones in our body is this protein called P-glycoprotein. Um, so our cells are separated from the world with an outside layer called a membrane. And you can see a membrane here um, in the transparent circles and outlined with the red and gray. And in this membrane, the blue protein, P glycoprotein, sits and uh, its function is to export molecules from inside the cell to outside the cell. Um, and that way it protects us from toxic things. It's really good at its job. So we know that uh, PGP transports at least hundreds of molecules, um, some of which are shown here. Um, but the problem is then some of those molecules we actually do want to be inside our cells. So paclitaxel, for example, is involved in chemotherapy, um, and we very much want it to do its job. Uh, so one of the main factors in multidrug resistance in chemotherapy is actually, is actually P glycoprotein. So the question now becomes, how does P glycoprotein move so many molecules? This is actually really unusual. Um, proteins we normally think will interact with you know, one or two things, but PGP is really unique for moving so many different molecules. Um, well, we don't know, is the short answer. This is what we think happens, and this is based on how um, the molecule, the protein on the left, which is structurally similar, structurally similar to PGP, exports things from the cell. Um, so what we think happens is this molecule called ATP, which uh, provides the energy for a lot of biological processes in the cell, binds to PGP, and then some drug or molecule goes into the membrane goes into some binding site, we're not quite sure yet um, where it is, and then the molecule flips, or PGP flips, and kicks it out. Um, so we would really like to, so this is what we think happens, but we'd really like to confirm it and to really know the details so that we can start designing drugs that we know will get into the cell instead of investing a lot of time and effort into development without, like, and then put it in someone's body and then immediately see nothing happen. Um, Right, so we have this amazing structure that experimental chemists have given us. But the problem with the structure, even though we can see quite finely what, is, what it looks like, is that we can't see how it moves. And so this is where uh, computational, comes, computational chemistry comes in. So computational chemistry, I tried really hard to think of a way to explain it, but honestly, it's just using computers to answer chemical questions. And these days, um, quantum chemistry is mostly defined, um, split into two fields. And the first one of this is quantum chemistry. Um, so what you can see on the screen here, this is the Schrodinger um, equation. And in principle, um, that is the answer. The Schrodinger wave equation is the complete physical description of any system. That's great. <laughs> problem solved, time to go home. Ha. Um, the problem with the Schrodinger equation is that we can't solve it for things with more than two bodies. And unfortunately, that thing is hydrogen. A lot of people think the universe contains more things than one atom of hydrogen. So, um, so sad face. So that's where molecular dynamics comes in. Oh, actually, no, I should um, point out there are a bunch of quantum, chem quantum chemistry methods that like, try and make approximations to make it easier with various degrees of accuracy. The main point is that the more accurate you get, the longer it takes. And the main reason I'm showing this picture is because the thing on the left is the concept in QM known as Jacob's Ladder. Um, a ladder all the way up to chemical heaven, or the real answer, and it leads to amazing pictures in journal articles that look like this. <laughs> uh, the paper for that is in my acknowledgements, and I'll put my slides up on GitHub if you want to go read it. Um, right, so molecular dynamics. Uh, QM is way too hard. Let's, let's go simpler. Let's use classical physics um, to work out how a system of atoms can evolve through time. So we use this fancy equation. Um, and the, the basic point of it 
is that if we can quantify the energy in a system of atoms, we can work out where it's going to be at a future point in time. And the energy I'm talking about is called the potential energy. And it can be sort of as the energy, kind of the difference between the energy of atoms in a particular state and the energy of atoms infinitely separated, so like infinitely relaxed. Um, and how do we get this potential energy? You might be familiar with the concept of an atom as having protons, neutrons, quarks, things, electrons. Um, and chemists in particular will you know, be familiar with the notion that electronic interactions drive chemistry. That's too hard. Um, instead, we will define an atom as a ball. It is a point with a radius and a mass, and everything else is just springs and really easy interactions. Um, and you get the eventual equation down the bottom, slightly cut off, um, where like bonds are just this quadratic, angles are another quadratic, these are the springs, um, some uh, angly stuff and non-bonded interactions. So now that we've defined this, uh, and this equation, we can use molecular dynamic simulations to look at how things move. Yay. Um, so this is the kind of thing that um, we can get from a simulation. This is not, not my thing, but this is something um, Chris Spronk did uh, a couple of years ago, where you can see uh, this protein, and every protein is always a linear chain of atoms when it comes out, folds into a 3D structure, which is really cool. Um, now, that is actually quite hard. That would have taken quite a bit of computational power. So for my first demonstration of MD simulations, I'm going to simulate morphine and water. And um, this is how morphine looks, like this, not very interesting. Um, and we can use this library called OpenMM in Python to do that. So uh, import all the things. Um, you have to initialize a system by loading in uh, these coordinates, the input coordinates, and a topology, which is a file that describes the interactions um, codified in that equation I showed earlier, and start off creating a system with some parameters that I probably won't go into. To initialize a uh, simulation, you choose how you want to integrate your equation. Um, you can choose cool things like um, which temperature or which average temperature you want it to be. I fix 300 Kelvin because it's a nice round number and it's kind of like body temperature. Uh, the second one defines how closely you want your simulation to keep to the temperature because it is going to vary. And then you want to pick your time step because uh, we have to pick discrete time steps to integrate it over. And um, the general time step that you get in, in molecular dynamics is two femtoseconds, which is two quadrillionths of a second. Right, so uh, start it off, minimize the energy. Um, this is just something I'm hooking on so I can see the output. It's going to save it into a file called this. And also, because I'm impatient, I want to see what it's doing as it's going. So if you run it, which I might do here, um, cool, we get 1,000 steps. And 1,000 times 2 quadrillionths of a second is still 2 trillionths of a second. So not very long. But the cool thing is now we can watch it on this notebook. Cool. Uh, there is water. I just didn't bother showing it because um, it tends to make the simulation lag a bit. It's a lot of atoms. Right, um, so where does Python come into this apart from that? Um, there are kind of three, three stages to any molecular dynamic simulation um, investigation, I guess. There's the setup, which I completely skipped over before. So when I loaded in those mysterious files for morphine and water, I had to set those up in a different uh, program because Python doesn't really have tools suitable for that kind of thing yet. Um, so that's how I mysteriously got my structure and my topology. Um, the simulation, yes, OpenMM can do that. It is actually quite unusual to do MD simulations with Python. So, um, if you, so most MD engines, um, partially because of when uh, molecular dynamics first started, are built on lower level languages like C, C++, and Fortran. If you look at this uh, small timeline of the major packages that we still use today, um, you can see that OpenMM is the only one with Python, and it came on relatively recently. So um, instead, where we currently use Python a lot is in the analysis. Um, so if we, say, wanted to know how peak glycoprotein, the protein I first presented, uh, moves in a membrane with that, with, in these three conditions, uh, I can go through those in a Python notebook, in a Jupyter notebook, like I will today. Um, so these were all done with Gramax, um, one of the engines that does not use Python, uh, which is fast, flexible, and free. 
And you can see uh, these are actual trajectories that are floated in. Um, each of these simulations is 200 nanoseconds, which is about 100,000 times um, the time length of the morphine simulation I did. And the interesting thing here um, is this last simulation, because this last one has ATP bound. It's, this small, uh, it's these two small green things over here, and also morphine, where we kind of think it is up there. Uh, we kind of think it's there. We're not quite sure. It's probably there somewhere. Um, and this, this simulation is interesting. Can't make horizontal again. Because you will see that this protein does not do the thing that we thought it did. It does not do the flip. Um, so clearly, this simulation is somehow inadequate. It's not long enough, or it's not big enough, or it doesn't use good enough parameters um, to see it flip. So the only way we can really find maybe interesting facts about this is to see instead of how um, is to see how p glycoprotein moves maybe in comparison to it without the morphine or to without the ATP. And so I'm just going to run through some quick stuff here. Right, Python for analysis. There are a lot of different packages that we can use for computational chemistry. I've mostly put up the ones with logos on this slide. Um, but I'm going to use MD analysis for this one, uh, partially because I have experience with it, because it has a lot of things that are predefined and I'm a bit lazy, and also because it lets me write custom analysis if I need to. And most investigations will need something custom. Um, and the first one I'm going to show is this super simple one. It's what everyone always does first. It's called the rate mean squared deviation. And that's kind of a way to compare the similarity between structures. So the way you compute it is you compute the Euclidean distance between atom A and atom A of structure one and structure two, and then atom B for both of them and so on. And you compare them all and average them out. And the number you get at the end is a way to um, see the similarity. Um, so that's not doing about it. Um, MD analysis defines it for us, yay. Um, so I run it, it's really easy. Uh, I only want to look at the protein in this one. That's why I've written slit atoms protein. I don't care about the water. I don't care how similar it is to each other. Um, and this is the kind of result you get out. So on the left is the frame number. On the, in the middle is the time step, because I might not have written it out every thousand steps or something. And the last column is the actual number I want. Um, when I visualize it, I'm going to use Plotly. This is where Python really comes into MD analysis and makes it good. It's the interactivity and the ability to share. So Plotly is probably one of the better packages for that. There are others, of course, but it's quick and easy. And Plotly really likes data frames, so I will convert this to a data frame. Um, and that's what it looks like. Uh, oh, I should probably say I put this in a function because I'm going to do it three times, and I don't want to rewrite it every time. Um, right, that's what it looks like. Uh, again, you have the frame, you have the time picoseconds. And I've also labeled which simulation it's going into um, because I'm going to eventually concatenate them. Um, oh, first, I guess I'm going to show what this looks like, but eventually I'm going to concatenate them. Um, so that's the RMSD for one simulation. Um, a higher value means it's less similar. And because I've calculated it from the first frame, uh, which is something you do to see how far it deviates from the experimental structure, uh, it starts up at zero. So you can see it actually moves quite a lot. Um, we always measure things like with a protein, four angstroms is usually about where we think um, it's, it's similar. Uh, and this one goes quite high, so it's moving away. It doesn't really mean much by itself, so let's do it for the other simulations. Blah, blah, um, concatenate them all and put them all into a graph, which, okay, it's more visible like this. Um, right, and this is kind of weird. So P glycoprotein by itself is in the middle between the other two. Um, so if you add ATP, it makes it move more, but if you add ATP and morphine, suddenly it moves less. Why is that? Who knows? Um, maybe the next things will tell us. Um, so the next thing I'm going to show you is the root mean squared fluctuation. This is really similar to the RMSD, except where the RMSD was kind of, um, you got one number for a point in time, and that number represents the deviation for every single atom. The RMSF flips that, and you get one number per atom, or per whatever region you're, you're looking at, um, that averages over the time. Um, for this one, I'm actually not going to do it for all the protein atoms. I'm only going to do it for one atom per residue, 
Because if you remember from the video I showed earlier, a protein is always a linear chain folded into a 3D structure. Um, and if you have a look at the linear chain in, in uh, pick like a protein, these um, dots represent the central carbon atom in every amino acid, and every amino acid will have one of them. So it's kind of a good way to cut down on the amount of computation that you want to do, um, which I do want to do here, and also to only look at the things that you expect to be the most stable, um, because that lets you quantify overall motion. So I'm going to select those atoms. I'm also going to label these atoms. And the reason um, I do that is because the experimental structures that we get, they're not always complete. That's partially why computational chemistry exists, to make up for these gaps in knowledge. So uh, the first um, 29 residues, or amino acids of p-glycoprotein, they're just missing, and also the last four. And also in the middle, there is a big chunk, and that's the most important part, um, because the ones at the end, they're probably flopping around, but we don't know what's going on in the middle. All right, so I label those, so it's representative. It doesn't look like one part is just joining up to another part that's really far away. Um, also put it into a data frame and label the simulation again. And if I put, do it to all of them and I concatenate it again, I eventually get this graph. Um, so this part in the middle is the part where there's a big chunk missing. That's why there's just a line there. Um, and um, the residues go from 30 to 1,200 and something. Those are the actual amino acids in the protein. And you can see here that the results have changed slightly. So even though um, I think it was, oh gosh, p protein and ATP, that was the red one, that was the most unstable before, uh, it's actually moved down to the bottom again. And that's probably just because I selected um, only the central carbon atoms this time instead of all the atoms, which tells us that the side chains, the extra bits, are flopping around a lot. But the overall motion actually has um, this system being the most stable and peach glycoprotein without anything bound being the uh, most movie. And in some ways, that is expected because as soon as you get something bound, you kind of change the range of motion that a protein can have. Um, so I guess that's good to see. Um, and the last thing I'm just going to show today, today is just like, um, a selection of maybe the most obvious things that we do when we get a simulation is principal component analysis. Um, and this is just, again, another way of comparing the structural similarity of atoms. Um, and it's like an RMSD, except now we, instead of having all the atoms flopping around and kind of being unable to tell where the overall motions are, we try and reduce it down to a lower dimensional space so that we can, uh, I guess, more clearly see the biggest differences or the biggest variances in the motion. Um, and we want to do that this time. Instead of doing it separately for all of them, uh, we're going to put them into the same uh, general space so that we can plot out the differences. So MD analysis makes this a little bit finicky. Uh, we actually have to join them together into one simulation because we can't put them all into the function. Um, so this is not very interesting, just copying coordinates, putting them all into one, making a new trajectory. Um, and you can see, I've only picked the protein atoms this time. There's 11,961 of them. Um, and if you join them together, I get 602 frames. It turns out, I realized this while I was making the slides, I lost a frame off the last trajectory. Um, anyway, once you've joined it, the PCA is really easy. Again, MD analysis defines this function for us. Um, runs it, you get the principal components. Um, and you can transform your structures into this lower dimensional space so you can plot it out easily. Uh, and this, uh, again, I've only selected the central carbon atoms, mostly because I want to make this analysis fast. Um, this is the data frame that you get at if you um, split it all out. Here I've um, labeled the simulations like this. You can see that I've lost a frame off the last one, um, just so that we can separate them out when we plot them. Okay. Onto the real reason I really like Jupyter Notebooks. Um, this is a bit of a complicated figure. This is uh, the first principal components plotted out on the 3D axis. Um, you can tell that the simulations are different because they have different markers. Um, circle is p glycoprotein by itself. Uh, diamond is here on the left, uh, p glycoprotein with ATP, and the last one is on the right, the square. Um, the colors represent the time. So you can see that 
um, they start off where the blue is. Uh, you can see that uh, P glycoprotein with ATP starts off very similar to the one without it, but then morphine is all the way by itself over here. Um, it's weird. Um, this is honestly a bit hard to see, so it's good that I can quite easily change how the graph looks and make it align. Um, and now they're colored again by simulation. They're kind of similar. Uh, morphine is just off by itself. So clearly the biggest variance, or maybe clearly, but a lot of variance separates these three anyway. Um, but it's weird that this starts off by itself. Um, something else that you can do um, is to make it animated. So this one will take a couple of seconds to re-render. Um, but this is one of the best parts of being able to interact because you can actually just select where you want to see it over time and you can see uh, where it is on the principal axes. Um, this is not very interesting with only, thanks, um, with only uh, one simulation of each. Um, but normally when we do simulations, we do replicates or we do repeats of each one and it's because, um, it's because of the way we, uh, it's because in molecular dynamics is a bit of a statistical method and every time we run a simulation, we're going to get different results. Um, and also, for, for the lazy, ooh, what have I done? Let me do this again. Right, for the lazy, we can just see how the, how the things vary along combinations of principal components just in one quick graph. So this is a bit of a love letter to Plotly, really. But um, yeah, it's, I guess an example of why we often do a lot of analysis in Python. And I would like to make conclusions about this. This is a bit of a, you know, I've asked a question and I haven't answered it. Well, I'll be honest, in my abstract, I did say I wasn't answering any questions. Mm -hmm. um, it's because um, molecular dynamics um, is a method that requires a lot more sampling, um, a lot more data than we have here. And uh, when I, and I'll describe the past and current state of molecular dynamics to give you an idea of why this question has not been answered, currently probably can't be answered, but maybe will be in the future. All right, so before computational chemistry came along, what were people doing? Apparently, they were getting rubber balls and sticking them together with rods and trying to work out the physics physically in the office. Um, and apparently getting interrupted by students a lot. Uh, this is interesting because actually the first molecular dynamic simulation was done a few years before that, so maybe he didn't have to do that. Um, but I guess we all choose our own hobbies. Um, by 1975, we'd started simulating biological things, and you can see how quickly this thing has grown because by 2006, we started simulating a full um, virus capsid, which is a million atoms, and for 50 nanoseconds. And when we get this new supercomputer that was built specially for this field, then we start seeing um, much longer timescale simulations. And you can also see this if you look at the, uh, the number of publications in Scopus matching molecular dynamics, which interestingly, uh, so it starts off at you know, roughly zero, <laughs> and then uh, peaks at around 16,000. And I like this figure because it looks remarkably similar to the Gartner Hive cycle. <laughs> so, that is encouraging. I am hoping that the second peak is not another peak of inflated expectations. We're not going right back up again, but it has become the plateau of productivity, but I guess we'll just have to see. Um, so back to the problem of why can't we find out how peak protein moves? Well, we can't, we can't get the entire universe as balls and springs. When I made the title, I, I lied to you. Um, and that's partially, that's because of a few fundamental flaws with this equation that this whole field is built on. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the parameters that we get, they're manually optimized. So expert, not even expert scientists, but expert molecular dynamics specialists, um, when we want to modify or update a force field, they have to invest, uh, invest huge amounts of time and effort to do anything. That's a bit of a problem because it's also a bit inaccurate. So this functional form that we're using, quadratics, they do not represent the chemical complexity of the universe. They, they represent a, an algorithm that is easy to compute. And finally, with these non-bonded interactions, if we do it for, um, for every atom with every other atom, that's going to scale quadratically, which I made fun of as simple, but I mean, that goes up quite fast. 
So right now, our simulations, they still top out at millions of atoms. But then you think of a typical human cell, that's hundreds of trillions of atoms. So we have quite a long way to go. So onto the future, is there any hope for us? Um, I think so. If we look back at this slide, um, the problems, um, the Python is getting a lot more um, into, I guess, or people using Python getting a lot more into solving the yellow and the green, the setup, sorry, the yellow and the orange, the setup and the simulation. Um, so the part where experts have to invest their time into improving these force fields, that's part of the setup, that's part of the topology. And um, this new initiative, which launched in October last year, the Open Force Field, is specifically aimed at improving that situation. So um, they're very into openness. Um, the aim of their mission is to both generate a bunch of experimental data to fit the uh, force fields too, um, and then to iteratively improve them and publish them um, as they go instead of waiting like everyone else, waiting years until the force field is absolutely perfect, publishing them, and then finding flaws. Um, and they've actually already uh, published one version called Smirnoff. Um, I don't remember what this is actually named after, but it's a force field for small molecules. And what is cool about it is that you can just give it a molecule. So this morphine smiles, uh, it's not as smiley, um, is, is a way to encode a morphine molecule in a single line. So SMILES is um, one way that we can encode 3D structure into a line. And we can generate the parameters for this morphine molecule just using this force field, just like this. Um, whereas previously, I just had to make mysterious input files and, and put them in. So. For the simulation, um, a lot of people are interested in using machine learning to get the potential energy instead of going through that flawed, inaccurate function. Um, and everyone uses Python. Um, so on the left, you can see two packages that are specially for chemistry, um, the deep chem and the atomistic machine learning package, I think. Um, and you know, on the right, everyone uses PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, and most recently, on July 1st, um, there was a neural network published that achieves near gold standard quantum chemistry accuracy. So if you remember at the start, I was talking about quantum chemistry and how we can't get anywhere near that, so we just approximate it with molecular dynamics. This is like going two steps up. Um, quantum chemistry is better than molecular dynamics in terms of accuracy, and then we're going to near gold standard of that. So that's a massive jump up in accuracy. Um, and you can see um, them using this neural network um, to simulate a bunch of carbon nanoparticles, and you can see them aggregating together, which is really cool. Um, for the analysis, so analysis right now, it seems like we can use Jupyter notebooks for analysis, but only for small analysis. Um, as we try and improve the scaling and make molecular dynamics faster and bigger, we're going to get more and more data. So, you know, my data sets, they're already going to the hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes if I'm not careful. Um, and it can get to be a real pain, storing, analyzing um, those data. So uh, this new, so molecular dynamics, um, MD analysis, sorry, the package that I used throughout this talk, they're working on a parallel version as well that's um, makes use of Dask to do uh, distributed and parallel computing. Um, that is still an alpha, but I am personally excited for it. And finally, communications. So this, uh, these slides, were actually built from a Jupyter notebook. And if this works, um, I think, how do I do this again? Ah, W. Right, you can see um, these slides here. Ooh, okay, this is an overview of all the slides I have, but I can also quit, and it's just a notebook. And that's how I execute most of my code when it shows up. Uh, and also some stuff that I don't need to see, like um, that mysterious display good function. Well, that is not loading. That's unexpected. But anyway, all right, here is the notebook. Yeah. Um, communication, when it works. Um, 
So that's a really good way because you can pass around materials, you can pass around analyses, and you can interact with them. Um, this is also online. I've published a slightly, uh, slightly not up-to-date version already online, and it's also on my binder, and it can be run as both a slasher and a notebook um, of my binder. So hopefully uh, one day we will work out how P-glycoprotein works. We'll be able to put P-glycoprotein into an even more complex system and maybe see how that works, maybe even see how a cell works one day. Who knows? It's a future. Let's draw trust in Python. So thank you to everyone. These are all the papers I stole figures from. These are all the packages I used. Thanks to everyone who gives me money. Um, and to you. Um, thank you, Lily. And here is the souvenir from PyCon AU. Thank you. So,